there's no such thing as the perfect base that will work for everything. Yeah. And to an extent, the way I hit the strings is going to be with me whatever I do. So sometimes I think, oh, if I get a different bass, I'll get quite a different sound. Well, usually it isn't. Oh, right. <laughs> um, but, you know, you've got to pick up nearer the bridge. That will give you a more trebly sound. The yeah. closer it is this way, it'll be more bassy. Somewhere in the middle, like a typical Fender bass, um, will be the right kind of balance between the two. So that's mostly what I'm using, but I'd be blending in using the pan control, a bit of this pickup as well, for most situations I'm in. Yeah. For something I w where I wanted to stick out, I'd probably be much more on this pickup. Um, then I've got bass and treble control, boosting or cutting, so I might be adding probably a little bit of bass in actual fact just to give it fuller sound. Um, but, you know, it gets down to more I don't know, esoteric things yeah. where compared to Fender bass, these halves of the pickup are in the opposite position, whereas normally they'd be here for quite a bassy sound and here for quite a trebly sound. When you swap them over, it tightens up the bottom two strings yeah. tonally and makes these a bit less trebly. So to me, that's more how I like it to be. But, yeah, yeah. you know, that might not be how I want it to be, for example, playing Queen songs. Sure, so yeah. I would have the more standard precision type setup. You know, I bought it second hand, I don't know yeah. when exactly it was made, probably five or six years old. Yeah. Um, it's a fairly standard kind of design that a lot of companies do. I just happen to like the quality of this particular uh, manufacturer. Yeah. Um, it has some special features you showed uh, earlier. Can you just go through that? That, that's, that was quite an interesting uh, uh, tuning uh, system at the back there. Well, that's just something I put on most of the bases where you can flip the bottom string down. You can't hear it, but it go, it'll go down from E to D. So if you're playing in D and you want the low D, either you play a five string, which you, it's sort of, if you're, if you're used to a four string, then it doesn't feel very natural. A lot of people just play five strings, but often they're playing the low notes far too much. It's not, it doesn't sound right always. So uh, with this, it allows you to just quickly flip down to that note and bring it straight back up again. I've learned over the years to try and get a good sound direct from the bass, not having to rely on pedals or a particular amp or a particular compressor in the studio or something like that. Um, just so that I'm in control, kind of with my fingers and maybe a few little adjustments on the bass itself. And I think what people don't realize, a lot of it can be to do with the strings you use and actually how hard it is to play. If it's very easy and light and, you know, a breeze to play at a thousand miles an hour, then usually the sound is quite thin and weedy and, you know, it makes you play fast because you're trying to fill in the gaps. So if I was in a situation where that was required, I might have to completely change my technique or, or and, and how the bass was set up but for most things I do it needs a, a big sound so therefore you you end up with a bass that's probably quite hard to play and with a higher action than most, than most people like um, and that actually stops me from doing everything I could do for you know the compromise is let's try and get a good sound so if it's really solid playing a very simple part, it stands up on its own. Um, timing wise, you know, if you took the drums away, the bass is still very solid. That's important. Yeah. Uh, tonally, people often listen to instruments on their own. 
and that's not really right. It, 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 you know, it shouldn't sound horrible on its own, but it's how it fits into the whole thing. And to me, it's kind of a bit annoying these days that you can listen with a microscope. Oh, that's slightly a fraction out of time. Oh, let's move that. Or, or let's, you know, kind of going for perfection above inspiration or, or you know, mm. if you if you examine mm. albums that have sold tens of millions if you, the, from 30, 40 years ago, yes, you can find tons of things that are out of tune, out of time, but does it matter? It's now true. people are so obsessed with everything being, you know, absolutely perfect and pristine and wonderful. Maybe not so much on your yeah. <laughs> recording. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but um, uh, that, that's, you know, that, yeah. uh, you're, get, you're missing the point, really. Yeah. I grew up in quite a musical family with lots of different kinds of things going on. We're talking back in the 50s and 60s, really. So I would be hearing not much, I suppose, pop and rock music, but lots of folk and classical and jazz and all kinds of things. And then as a teenager, I was getting into some of the things that were popular, Beatles and Stones, but really much more kind of bluesy stuff. During my teenage years, I was playing the drums. Before that, I was playing classical piano and that followed up with classical trombone. And it happened that somebody at school had somehow converted a guitar into a bass and I picked that up and really took to it. If, let's say, this bass hadn't been around at school, maybe I would never have been a bass player. You're very much a product of, of the era that you came out of. Sure. Yeah. I mean, for me, I was 15 in 1965, therefore, whatever was going on right then, 50, uh, 65, 66, was blues, blues rock music, really. Yeah. So that's been my thing, the bedrock yeah. for me, that you build everything else up on. Yeah. I was very lucky to be around at that time and went to see every band under the sun. <clears throat> Things like Zeppelin's first London show and just you name it, Cream, Hendrix, um, Janis Joplin, or the band, just the Who, you know. I got to know the bass player who was playing with Jeff Beck at a certain point in about 1970. He was a really fantastic uh, Trinidadian bass player who was very like James Jameson from Motown. He had that whole style. And so that really influenced me in a, in a way, he was my mentor and influenced me towards soul and funk and R&B and stuff like that, which I might not otherwise have got into so much, though the blues side of it was there, obviously, previously. The trouble is that you had a kind of golden era of music emerging, you know, sort of grown-up rock music, as it were, classic rock music, and you can't really reproduce that. That, that, that. The situation that brought that about is gone. So you can kind of copy it, or you can do your version of it, or you can play almost the same thing to young people who, to whom it's brand new, and look, oh, there's young, sexy guys doing it instead of old codgers like me. Um, so, but to me, it's kind of been and gone, yeah. and I was lucky to be there when it was all happening new in the first time. Sure. But that came out of a particular social situation or whatever was going on in the world at that time, and also, you know, music kind of was becoming experimental, and the difficulty is you. you with anything, you you explore all the different possibilities and then it just becomes either very repetitive or gets too complicated for people to be interested in. Yeah. Um, 
so you start retreading it again. Yeah. And really, I mean, nowadays, most of what I do is playing to people roughly my age yeah. to remind them of the good times they had when they were 18, you know, which is good, yeah. but it's not, it's not actually how it should be, but yeah. that's, that's how things are. Career-wise, a lot of things have followed one after the other because of having worked with this person they then yeah, yeah. recommend you again or use you again, etc., etc. Um, in '77, Bernie Marsden joined the the beginnings of White Snake, and he got me along to help out when they were auditioning a drummer, and they had a bass player, but he basically decided not to do it, and I got the chance to join the band, but. That wouldn't have happened if I didn't know Bernie from before, etc., etc. There were times when I might be thinking, God, how am I going to pay the rent this week? Yeah. And there would be periods, particularly, I don't know, in, in 1977, before joining Whitesnake, I was earning virtually nothing from music at all. I'd be on the dole, and then I was working in a Virgin record store shrink wrapping the albums in the back room, you know, just for yeah. a, a very small wage really just to just to exist. But certainly at that point, still for the first I don't know, five, ten years of being professional, I mean I was very one track minded about being a bass player, whereas in actual fact it would have been more sensible career-wise to have been more diverse and think about singing, songwriting, playing the guitar, not just focusing so much on being a bass player, but mm. that's, that's what happened. <laughs> yeah.